Okay, welcome to the second meeting of the CHAP on phthalates and phthalate substitutes. We're uh, a little bit uh, delayed uh, due to the weather issues, and in fact, some of the CHAP members are still on their way. Uh, and I'm Hope I'm looking around. I'm hoping the speakers all made it in, but if we have to, we'll we'll adjust the schedule accordingly. Um, but thank you all for coming, for braving the storms, and we look forward to uh, all of your testimony. Bill. Again, my uh, welcome on behalf of the committee. Um, We've got a, a full schedule for uh, these three days, and I thank you all for uh, participating. And I thought we'd start off uh, by uh, introducing ourselves, so if some of you don't uh, know members of the CHAP, and, and uh, as, as Mike has indicated, not all of us are, are here yet. Um, but my name is uh, Philip Merkus, and I, was, I spent most of my career at the University of Washington in Seattle in the Department of Pediatrics, and I'm a developmental toxicologist, and um, I agreed to, to be the, the chair of, of this uh, committee. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to now have the other members of the committee uh, introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about themselves. Andreas? Um, I'm Andreas Kortenkamp. Uh, I'm professor at the School of Pharmacy, Center for Toxicology at the University of London. Um, my background really is uh, in mixture toxicology, cumulative risk assessment, both experimental studies, uh, but also thinking about regulatory approaches and regulatory um, implications. We've carried out a number of experimental studies in that direction. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm Chris Jennings, professor, professor of biostatistics at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. I've um, spent many years doing methods development for um, statistical methods for evaluating um, and designing studies for um, chemical mixtures. I'm Michael Babbage from the Directorate for Health Sciences at CPSC, and I'm the project officer for uh, phthalates. I'm Cheryl Falvey, the general counsel here at the commission. Nice to meet all of you. As I understand, uh, Russ Hauser is, is on his way. Um, Bern Schwetz uh, will hopefully join us uh, early this afternoon. Um, and Paul Leoy is not able to uh, join us uh, at this session. So I'd like to start now by uh, having uh, Cheryl Falvey talk to us about uh, the, the charge. Thanks. I think I'm going to just stay here so that we can have a give and take. I really wanted to be available for your, to answer your questions today. And the chairman asked me to speak to you um, really about two things. First is to review the statutory provision with you in case you had any questions about the scope of the work that you're to do. And if, if um, mm -hmm. excuse me, if I can interrupt, there's a copy of the statutory language in your uh, folders under uh, the tab business. If you go past the two copies of the meeting notice, there's a copy, of, uh, an extract. It says Consumer Product Safety Act, and there's an extract that includes the language describing the, the CHAP. Sorry. That's fine. So I want to go over that language with you and answer any questions that you may have. I, if I can't answer them now, I'll know what the questions are, and we can get you answers later over the course of the next two days. Um, the other thing I wanted to do is explain how your work may be used by the Commission in other ways beyond the statute um, as we're thinking through issues relating to implementing this statute. So those are the two things I want to talk about. Um, first, to get into the statutory mandate, you've been given a lot to do. 
Um, Congress has asked you to be at least four things. Independent, they want you to take a de novo look at the issues of health presented by the phthalates. Um, in addition to being independent, they want you to be very scientific. And you can see that in a, in a string of the relevant data you're supposed to review. The most recent, best available, peer-reviewed scientific studies. So they want you to look at objective science in reaching your conclusions here. Um, in addition to being independent and scientific, they certainly want you to be comprehensive. And you can see how comprehensive when you look at the detail that they've given you in terms of the scope of your examination. You're to examine all the potential health effects of the full range of phthalates. That's not just the six, the, the three that have been permanently banned and the three that have been in, um, uh, interimly banned, but all of the phthalates. You're to consider the potential health effects of those phthalates both in isolation and in combination with one another. You're to look at the likely levels of children's, pregnant women's, and others' exposure to phthalates. So that asks you to look at an exposure level. And that's very important for us, as you'll see, as we continue your work once the CHAP has concluded its work. And you'll be making reasonable estimations under both normal and foreseeable use and abuse of such products. Those words, normal and foreseeable use and abuse, we use all the time. When we're dealing with children at the commission, there's an awful lot that children do that is, um, falls into the foreseeable abuse category. That there's certain activities by children, putting things in their mouth, that are foreseeable even if that's not what was intended by the manufacturer. And so you'll, you'll particularly want to look at those exposures. Those are important to us. Um, you need to consider the cumulative effect of total exposure of phthalates, not just from the products necessarily under our jurisdiction. We have jurisdiction over consumer products, but we don't necessarily have jurisdiction over products where FDA has jurisdiction. There, I say not necessarily because <clears throat> they have jurisdiction over food, cosmetics, and drugs. Medical devices falls into a different category. We, we've shared jurisdiction over medical devices with the FDA over time. And there are some things that you wouldn't think of that fall into the definition of medical device, like toothbrushes and um, sleep positioners, things where medical claims are made. And those um, fall into both of our jurisdictions. For you, you're to consider the cumulative effects of total exposure from both the children's products and all the other sources in the home, such as personal care products. That could be bath um, soap that's used. It could be the vinyl shower curtain in the bathroom. It could be um, <clears throat> deodorizers and other things in the home. <clears throat> you're to look at all of the relevant data, as I mentioned, and it has to be the best, the peer-reviewed, objective, scientific, and best available and most recent studies. And consider the health effects not only from ingestion, but from other routes of exposure, including dermal, hand and mouth, or other exposures. <clears throat> and then finally, um, consider the level at which there is a reasonable certainty of no harm to children, pregnant women, or other susceptible individuals and their offspring. Again, considering the best available science and using sufficient safety factors to account for uncertainties regarding exposure and susceptibility of children, pregnant women, and other potentially susceptible individuals. And um, our scientists, um, including <coughs> Dr. Babbage and others in the commission, can help you in thinking about the way we think about safety factors, and, because we're using those <coughs> both in our work here but also with things like lead and cadmium in trying to understand um, how those work in both the pregnant woman and the child. And um, one other charge you have is to consider possible similar health effects of phthalate alternatives that might be used specifically in what's been banned, which are the children's toys and childcare articles. I'll go over quickly what's been banned, just 
just to make sure everybody is clear about that and to tell you how your work might be relevant to our definitions. The permanent ban bans children's toys used by children 12 and younger, as well as child care articles, which are specifically defined in the statute as a consumer product that's designed or intended for the manufacturer to facilitate sleep or the feeding of children aged three or younger. I like to summarize it as things that children can use to play, to sleep, or to eat. That's kind of a quick rule of thumb that we use. We are going to be defining by rule children's toy child care article to give some more clarity because we've got numerous questions on what's covered, what's not covered by the statute. And understanding some of the work you're doing on exposure mechanisms may be relevant in, in, in that determination. Um, for example, you are going to be working on the interim ban phthalates, and one option at the end of your work is to leave the uh, ban in place. Uh, another option would be to remove the ban. And in between those two extremes, there may be other things that you would recommend to us. Uh, leave it in place for some products that can go into the mouth. The interim ban only applies to those toys that can be placed in a child's mouth. Um, or perhaps there are other types of products, not just toys, that go into a child's mouth that would be relevant for you to consider. Those are the kinds of things your work will help inform us on. Um, I'll give you an example. Right now, uh, children in the United States are all wearing these, these little bands. They, they, they come out in a shape um, like a fish or a star, and then you can put it on your wrist. Well, that's not a toy, and they don't contain phthalates. They're made of silicone. But you can see that that's a good example of a product that doesn't fit into our play, sleep, and eat categories nicely. It's more of a novelty that you're wearing, um, but it could easily go into the mouth. And if, the, if they were to have contained phthalates, they might technically not fall into the definitions in the statute. If you were to find that phthalates shouldn't be in a product like that because the exposure in chewing on something like that would create a risk, that would be something that would inform the commission as they move forward way beyond your work to looking at other products. So one of the things that um, is a particularly sensitive issue right now that the chairman wanted to make sure I talked to you about was the concept of inaccessibility. So certain phthalates are used in um, the soft plastic that goes on the uh, outside of wiring, for example, um, on a cord. And we know that there are toys, for example, let's just take a, a baby doll, a generic toy. The baby doll is used by a young child. It might have a foot or a hand that could go into the child's mouth. If the baby doll can talk, because inside of it there's a steel box with wiring that enables the doll to say mama or cry or whatever it's going to do. <clears throat> the question is, should the phthalates inside of the doll that are not accessible, and they're not even in the foot or the hand that's being chewed on by the child, do those present a risk? Um, that's one extreme. But we also know that there are things that a child can chew on that might also have an inex technically inaccessible part. So for example, I've been told, although I haven't seen it, uh, that a teething ring might have two layers, the outer layer and the inner layer. And if there were phthalates in the inner layer and the child was chewing on the teething ring, which is its intended use for hours a day, those phthalates in the inner ring might present a risk. And so you wouldn't want to have a rule about inaccessibility that might work well for the baby doll example, but not work so well when we're talking about a teething ring 
where there might be an inaccessible layer that could present a risk. Um, in between those extremes, there are other examples. For example, um, mattresses, uh, mattress covers or the mattress itself for a baby's crib might have vinyl that could contain phthalates. A sheet might go over that. So you could have a sheet and then you could have a plastic cover to protect the mattress and then a vinyl covering on the mattress itself and the plastic covering on the crib or the vinyl on the mattress could contain phthalates. Are there any exposure risks from that? Is it inaccessible because of a sheet? Uh, if a baby lies on the crib for eight hours with the heat and um, uh, drooling and that kind of thing, are there any risks there? And so it, you know, when you think about our jurisdiction and all the different types of products and the different uses of phthalates in those products, your work will help inform us on making decisions um, on what we might recommend to Congress uh, as to the scope of this. This, this law is very um, prohibitory. I mean, it's a prohibition on the use of these phthalates at all, whether inaccessible or not. And some debate that, and certainly if we wanted to exclude something that was inaccessible, we would need to have the scientific um, basis for doing that from our staff or from the CHAP. And um, at that point, the commission could decide whether they felt they had the jurisdiction to do it themselves or go back and ask Congress to allow for an inaccessibility provision similar to something that we have in the lead portions of the CPSIA. So that gives you uh, a general sense of what we see some of the complexities of the legal issues in terms of the scope of the products that are covered by this. Um, it gives you a sense of how comprehensive we think your work will be, how it will interrelate to the work that we will be doing as a commission. Um, the final thing Congress asks is that the work be done in a timely manner. They've given 18 months to the CHAP. Um, all I can say is you've gotten a lot more time than we've gotten to do a lot of other things in the CPSIA. I think what's most important is we get it right. And um, while the timing is there and is important to follow, what's most important is to be working progressive, you know, progressive hard work towards a goal to get this done correctly. So um, with that, I think I'll stop and take any questions you might have on the charge or some of the issues that I've raised. Any questions? I have one question, and that is, um, as far as the timing goes, the language says 18 months to complete their examination and then six months for a final report. Uh, in my mind, those two steps tend to bl blur together. Um, so I see it as a total of 24 months, essentially. I mean, is that not correct? That's correct. I mean, the, the statute's pretty clear that they want 18 months of hard study and then not later than 180 days, six months after completing the examination, you're to prepare a report to the commission. And I think everybody understands that in the writing of the report, oftentimes you have to take even a close, closer examination as you're trying to say things certain ways. So I, I think we are all intending that the work will um, continue through the writing of the report to a final. And I don't see any reason why you can't start writing your report sooner as well if, if by writing it forces you to get issues crystallized, you can do that as well. And one thing that Mike had made, asked me to make sure I addressed um, is the scope of de novo review. Um, you need to be looking at this completely independently of the work that's been done by the commission in the past. That's not to say that you can't look at that work. You can. But they want you to look, go back and look, as all scientists do, at the underlying studies that were part of the first report and uh, 
think of it anew. Don't feel constrained by any prior determinations by us or prior CHAP. You're to look at this completely independently of that and, and afresh. And that's an issue that uh, several of us have, have discussed, uh, uh, the de, de novo aspect. Um, the NRC published a, a report not long ago that was really comprehensive and, and reviewed a lot of what, not everything, but a lot of what we're tasked with. And it, it seems to, you know, to plow that ground again doesn't really make sense. Uh, you know, they had experts looking at it. They wrote their report. Um, so what we would like to do is to build on that report. Uh, what, because that's only uh, current, I think, through 2007, as I recall. Uh, so what's new since then? I mean, we'd also look at uh, the, the issues they uh, address. But uh, in terms of the literature, I mean, it's, it's huge. And even having 18 months, um, a lot of literature to go through, and there are going to be some, you know, some very, uh, I would think, some contentious issues that we're going to have to deal with in terms of risk assessment as well. So, um, reviewing everything that the NRC committee reviewed doesn't, to my mind, make a whole lot of sense. Um, if we could build on what they have done would facilitate our task tremendously and I think give us an opportunity to really address some of the other questions that, that they did not. How does, how do you respond to that? Well, first I'd want to see and hear what the comments are from the public on, <clears throat> on that issue, whether that's, you know, hear from both sides on the issue about that. Um, I do think that scientists tend to re rely upon official reviews of literature um, and give weight to certain organizations like the NRC. Um, and so in your normal work, if you were doing this outside of the CHAP, you would approach that document in a certain way um, and give it credence, but also give it critique. So um, that's one way to look at the document. I think you uh, want to look at the underlying sources that the NRC uh, relied upon, but I don't think you have to replow ground that as a scientist you would say these other scientists, I, I respect their work, I think the work is solid, I've critiqued it with my own lens as well as um, looked at some of the underlying science. I wouldn't go so far as to say that you don't that you can just start there and build upon. I don't think that's what Congress had in mind when they said a de novo review. Um, but I do think all scientists look at reviews like that and rely heavily on them um, with with the appropriate scientific evaluation of them. And I that would be my advice. issue that, that uh, Byrne and I have talked about at, at some length is endpoints. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, clearly there, there's uh, distribution of, of the amounts of data with respect to different endpoints. So the, the developmental reproductive uh, effects probably uh, have more literature to, to speak to th that endpoint than, than the others. Um, and how far afield are we to go uh, in exploring, because um, you know, the, the endpoints are almost limitless that we could, we could look at, uh, although I think for many of them there probably isn't any information. Uh, so I'm a little bit concerned about that uh, open-ended uh, look at all endpoints, all health effects. Uh, can you give a little more counsel on how we might define that world a little bit more uh, specifically? Again, I think Congress expects you to be using scientific judgment and looking at the endpoints with the same prism that you would 
in the universities and in your work as scientists that you would give. So the developmental aspects deserve important scrutiny because there's obviously much more science that's developed and more recent science that's developed on those issues. Uh, Congress has asked you to consider and examine all of the potential health effects, the full range, but they want you to do that with in exercising your own scientific judgment. And if there are some where there's no science, um, you would give those less consideration than those where there's considerable science that's been built up. So again, it, it's just a matter of, of exercising, um, I wouldn't say common sense, but scientific common sense, so to speak, in a, taking what are you know, scant resources in terms of 18 months and trying to keep, tackle this in the way that be most protective of children. Reyes, Chris, either one of you have any questions? Um, Mike? I, I, I have a couple, a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, going back to the NRC report. Um, that was done uh, recently, uh, I think a, less than two years ago. It was done specifically to describe methods for doing a cumulative risk assessment on phthalates. Uh, it wasn't done by us. It was sponsored by EPA, but it was it really tailor-made for our purposes. Um, so, you know, it's not just a review. It uh, tells you how to go about doing such a thing, uh, such an assessment, which is no simple task. Um, as far as the many endpoints go, uh, as we often do or typically do in a risk assessment, NRC did essentially the same thing. They uh, looked at all the endpoints, reviewed all of the data, but in the end they focused on the developmental effects, uh, reproductive developmental effects. Um, and I guess my question is, do we have to literally do a quantitative risk assessment for multiple endpoints, or is there some room for judgment uh, where we weigh all the the endpoints and you know decide on which one is the most important to look at in more detail? I want to emphasize how important it is that we're getting public input on these issues um, in a meeting like the one we're having today, where you can hear from the range of perspectives on that very question. I I would say that what's important, what the what the statute is asking you to do, is to complete an examination of the full range of phthalates on the full range of potential health effects. But as scientists, you need to put on your own filter to that to make certain that you are looking at where the most likely scientific endpoints that are going to harm children. I mean, the most important thing to keep in mind in making those decisions is Congress wants to make sure that children are protected from exposures to these chemicals. And so what are the endpoints that are going to um, be relevant when you're looking at things like the children's exposures, pregnant women's exposures, and other exposures that might be causing these endpoints? Um, if at the end of your review, uh, having considered all of that, one particular endpoint leaps out as being the most deserving of a quantitative look um, as opposed to two or three or four, that would be fine. But I think it's too early to make decisions, you're just beginning your work, uh, as to how to, how to do that. Um, but over the course of this, I think the science needs to drive it. Um, and that's really what the CHAP is all about, having independent scientists driving to a conclusion. 
And, and again, I think, you know, relying on the NRC report with regard to making exposure assessment decisions is good science. You're not going to reinvent the wheel. However, if in the course of that, something unique to our products, unique to children's exposures, the mouthing, whatever it is, um, in the course of sleeping or eating, that jumps out that was not addressed by the NRC report, bioavailability, whatever that turned out to be. And I'm not, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not saying what that would or wouldn't be. Then you have an obligation to, to consider that and, and take the NRC report to the next step is really the way I would look at it. I guess I have one, one other question is there are so many phthalates. There are, we've identified 29 in addition to the, the six mentioned in the act. Uh, there, I mean, there are more in existence. Those are the ones that uh, seem to be commercially important. And we are, uh, well, going to maybe hear some testimony on that today, but uh, again, given the large number of them, it's, I don't think it's literally possible to look at all of them. Well, all I can do is tell you that the statute expects the commission to be looking at the exposures to the full range of phthalates that might be in the products that kids are in. Um, exposed to in their environment in the home, not just those that are in toys and childcare articles, but in the home generally as well. So um, I think you at least need to keep a broad open mind to what those exposures might be. I also think Congress knew that they gave you 18 months and you can't be expected to, you know, tackle um, know, beyond what can be reasonably done in 18 to 24 months either. So there's a tension there built in between the statutory deadlines and the comprehensive nature of what you've been asked to do. Because there, I mean, there's a little, to me, a little bit of ambiguity. It talks about uh, the full range of phthalates from all sources, but then they mention specific sources, and, and, and they talk about... Uh, Let's see, susceptibility uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, you know, they're focusing on children and, and the mothers, and then other times they're talking about everyone. It's, it's a little, little bit ambiguous in places. I know that one of the, the, the commissioners are very interested in knowing about phthalate alternatives and the risks associated yeah. with them taking one out, what else is going in, and how do we adjudicate the relative risks of the various substitutes. So I would hope that no matter the number, whether it's 29 or 35, that, that you're really focusing on commercial application and the likely substitutes so that we can know, again, we're trying to be most protective of the children, and the last thing anyone wants to see happen is something taken out, but something more dangerous substituted in. And that's why I think it's important to not um, try to quantify, we don't have to look at this, you do have to look at this. You need to keep a broad, open mind, because phthalates alternatives, I'm assuming those are other types of phthalates, but I don't know that either. Yeah, well, I mean, there are 29 other phthalates, not to mention the non-phthalate alternatives. It's, it's also, I think, clear from what you said, though, that when we filter all this in terms of all health effects, so one health effect could be uh, a cancer endpoint with exposure to adults, that that would be less 
uh, under our purview as exposures that would result in uh, possible effects on children. Is that, am I reading you correctly on that? That we could say, yes, there may be uh, an issue in terms of an exposure to an adult uh, for this particular endpoint, but we're going to focus on exposures that affect children. The examination is defined um, in the law to require a complete examination of the full range of phthalates that are used in products for children and shall examine all the potential health effects, including endocrine disrupting effects of the full range of phthalates. There are several places where they talk about pregnant women, but I think that the thrust of this chap was to focus on children uniquely and probably differently than the NRC report. In, in that's that's another one when it says the full range of phthalates used in uh, children's products, essentially, um, that narrows the scope considerably. It does, except that it says consider the cumulative effect of the total exposure to phthalates from both the children's products and from other sources, such as personal care products. And I don't think they were limiting that to those, to just children's products. I think they're asking you to look in the home and see the other things, the shower curtains, the, um, what are those, the, um, air fresheners, those kinds of things that are adding to that exposure that you wouldn't really think to be a children's product. Right. I'll give you one other example of, since we're talking about this children's product issue, one of the um, issues that we have in food preparation for children. Um, there are products that are <clears throat> uniquely marketed as baby food mills. So that would be a product that would grind the food up so that you could make baby food. Um, that might have a, a, a plastic dish where the grinding's occurring. Uh, questions come up um, in the comments on our rulemaking and in comments asking us what's covered. Uh, is there a risk of phthalates when you're milling, you know, getting into the food. Um, we look at the phthalates provision as talking about the total content of anything that facilitates feeding. FDA has jurisdiction over um, the migration of the phthalates into the food. So it's one of these unique situations where both agencies have relevant authority. Um, there might also be phthalates in the cord that you use to plug the food mill in, and that would create a completely different exposure scenario than the plastic that's actually touching the food as it's being ground up. Those are the kinds of things we're wrestling with right now, is whether that's the kind of product that's presenting a risk and how. And so to the extent your work can inform some of those decisions, it would be helpful. Yes. Um, I have a question relating to um, this provision in number seven, um, the quantitation of risks or consider the level at uh, which there's a reasonable certainty of no harm to children. And you, you explained that and you offered kindly advice from the Commission in terms of dealing with those assessment factors or uncertainty factors. My question is this, um, this would tie the panel into a specific approach to deciding on, on levels of harm, uh, which has come under scrutiny or criticism lately. I'm referring to the NRC report science and decision where they <coughs> um, developed on the problems of this bright red line philosophy which, which is inherent in using uncertainty factor. My question is this, how uh, tightly are we bound to this specific way of quantitating risks or defining levels of no harm? 
I'm asking this because, for example, this uh, NRC report, Science and Decision, uh, advocates a different approach depending on the context of the questions that are asked. For example, under certain circumstances, um, instead of saying here's a bright red line, risks can be described in terms of um, probabilities. So my question is how, I mean, does that provision here not, to what way does it tie, tie us in to using a specific approach which has come under pretty stiff recent criticism? I'm going to take that question under advisement. It's a good one. It's not one that I want to answer just from a legal perspective without talking to some of our scientists. Um, <clears throat> but I see the point and I've read the, the green book there. And so um, let me circle back and maybe tomorrow we can find a time to squeeze me in and we'll come back and talk about that in more detail. Any other questions? All right, I think we should then start uh, presentations. Sorry. First panel. Oh, we've still got time. I guess we've we've scheduled a, a, a break, <laughs> actually. Yeah, yeah. because the first panel discussion doesn't start until ten, according to the. Right. Well, well we can take a break. Now, that's probably a good idea to start a little bit early because I think we're going to need all the time. Okay, so we'll take a 15-minute break and uh, get back at quarter to 10. If we could have uh, the second panel come up and take a seat. Um, oh, yeah. Is is Jim? Okay. Well, I think Diane's local, but we'll just get him in. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I, on this panel, we have Dr. Uh, Rainer Otter from BASF in Germany and Dr. Mark Holt from Eastman Chemical Company. And Dr. Otter, would you like to begin? Ladies and gentlemen, I would first like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give uh, the presentation here. We have already sent in written comments on those products where we found or thought that we would be eligible for commenting because these were all products that we are producing. I'm now concentrating on two products and in my talk I specifically will concentrate on three main topics of interest. The first is the understanding of data ownership because I think we should make you aware of that issue. Then there is some discussion on the availability and validity of the data that I have seen, especially in the part provided by the consultant. There needs to be some clarification in my view. And then I will elaborate a little bit more on the 
database of hexamal dinge and the dipropyl heptyl phthalate. You have published in the Federal Register that you would like to have this panel working as transparent as possible and therefore any information that you get is supposed to get to the public record. Um, there is another sentence in that you are not happy with summaries from toxicological studies prepared by manufacturers as substitutes for the full study reports. And now here comes the issue that I think you were not aware when you wrote down that part. On the reach, any producer or importer that has a study has a data protection for 12 years, as long as this whole study report is not made publicly available elsewhere. In that case, that you put up the stuff on the internet, a uh, third party would be eligible to just put together a robust study summary, only has to uh, comply with copyright issues, and could then bypass the data compensation issue. So what we need here is a decision from your side how this be can reconciled with this data ownership issues. I think that is not only affecting European producers, that is affecting any producer, also American producers, and that is a very serious issue. Then in the report on the substitutes, I saw a strange table um, indicating data availability based on tox line citations. And in my view, this gives the totally false and wrong impression that those alternatives that are already in use wouldn't have the right database. Um, a proof of that is that the consultant and his data mining strategy failed to get the whole NICNAS evaluation report of the Australian competent authority. He did a hell of a, a lot of work to pin down OECD guideline uh, requirements. However, it was unnecessary. The whole study report, robust study summaries, including our comments, including the comments from the competent authority, are published in the internet. And I have provided to you the link. Then we have an issue of peer-reviewed journals versus industry data summaries. And I'm now coming back to the second part that you would like to see not so much the manufacturer's um, data compilations. However, in the EPA HPV program, in the OECD HPV program, and in REACH, all the study summaries are done by industry, by those people very often that have done the studies. And under REACH, we have two articles, Article 119 and 120, that regulate the data exchange between competent authorities of the member states and of other regions. We are supposed to put in robust study summaries and robust and study summaries to ECHA. And whatever they get, they will hand over to another competent authority provided data protection claims are respected. And here you have again the problem with conflicting legislation. Um, with regard to these study reports, we just would uh, stress that all the labs uh, involved, they are doing this under good laboratory practice, they are regularly inspected, and the test facilities are on regular independent reviews. So I think there is no reason to um, yeah, put doubt on these data. With regard to hexamol dinge, um, there is a very broad and solid database available with regard to physicochemical data, ecotoxical and toxicological data. The original study reports have already been evaluated. I 
has to say, around the world from several tens of toxicologists in competent authorities. During the notification process in Germany, in the Netherlands, and from the European CENIA, the Scientific Committee for Newly Identified and Emerging Health Risks, here, I think, was a misunderstanding of the consultant putting together the data evaluation of the alternatives because I was reading here that study summaries were there that were lacking essential information. That is not the case. That was all written by Senia, and they have got under a non-disclosure and confidentiality statement all our original reports, and that is what they have concluded. So it's just what they wanted to publish. Um, as I said, the database was also evaluated by Switzerland, by Australia, where the reports are available. The Canadian company authorities have had the data and the US NSF. In a nutshell and in brief, um, there is no genotoxicity. It's not a reproductive toxicant. What I had to read in the report from the consultant is that he criticized the FOSTER protocol as being a non-OECD study. I think tomorrow morning there will be Paul Foster here and probably he will explain what are the details of that study. Um, we have a full generation study, a two generation study available on that product. And when I prepared for that meeting here, I had to see that another presentation will be showing here that on DINGE we would have a change in anogenital distance. This is only part of the truth. This comes when you are not, uh, you have no direct access to the data. However, what we have provided to you, there is the whole story is included. It was a reduction in both in males and in females, and this was related to body weight. And we couldn't find the same effect in the two generation study. Then um, for that compound, we have the teratogenicity study in rats and in rabbits. Um, and we couldn't find any developmental toxicity there. Also, in another presentation that you will hear today, there is an indication that hexamol dinge has caused thyroid adenomas. It's indicated possibly non-specific or not relevant. It is not relevant. And this is based on the fact that we have identified the mechanism, which is enzyme induction with an increase in T3, T4 turnover and elimination. This is based on EPA and IAC documents and has been accepted by several competent authorities around the world. For bis 2 propyl heptyl phthalate, the DPHP, again, it's not genotoxic. We have an OSD414 in the red for that compound. And as you can see, we have covered the critical window. Paul Foster has published several um, stuff on, the, on these things, on the critical window on phthalates. This is covered in that study here. It is a study by Oral Gabash. Again, I had to read in another presentation that you see in a couple of minutes probably that there would have been yeah, early resorptions. These early resorptions are clearly indicated also in what you have seen and what we presented as robust study summaries to you, these are related to maternal toxicity. Why is that? Because we have already a significant reduction in the early pregnancy. And so it's not the case that at the end of the whole story, uh, 10 times 3 grams are missing. It's already at the beginning, and at the end we had a 30% reduction it comes from three dams that essentially produced no viable pups, but we have dealt with that, and you have it in the data that we provided to you. Further to that, there is also a full two-generation study available according to OSD 416, including 
anogenal distance, anogenal index. There is no effect on that. Again, it's a proxisome proliferator, like most of the phthalates are. This was a question that we have been <coughs> made aware of by the European Commission, that you have approached them with regard to the issue, is depropyl heptyl phthalate just another de-isodesyl phthalate? The clear answer is no. Why is that? A, production process is completely different. B, last year my colleagues have shown you a chromatogram where DPHB co-chromatographed with DINP, with a C9. Here I'm showing you um, a GZMS where we spiked in the lower graph a dipropyl heptyl phthalate, sorry, a dipropyl heptyl phthalate. And see, you can clearly separate it. So this has been also the decision of the EU. And the formal stuff is there was a risk assessment on de-isodesyl phthalate and dipropyl heptyl phthalate was not included because it's a different substance. Opposite to that, in case of the DINPs, the two different DINP species were lumped together despite the fact that the production process is a little bit different, but they are too close. So then there was mentioning of um, the fact that DINGE is new in the market and lacks essential toxicological and uh, exposure information. For the tox part, I think I've clarified the issue. That's not the case. That's because of the yeah, missing consequent data mining strategy of the consultants. And I understood that they have said September 2008, they just missed the critical documents that came out later on. Yeah. So that's, I think this is an issue that can be resolved very quickly. With regard to the fact that human biomonitoring data are missing or exposure data are missing, yes, that is normal for new and innovative products. However, we will take care of that. There is a program within the German Environmental Protection Agency in cooperation with the German Chemical Producers Association uh, in the next couple of months, we will develop and provide to the German EPA with a reasonable documentation the human biomonitoring methods for detection of DPHP and hexamol dinge metabolites in urine. And uh, so I think, so far as I have heard from the discussions, they are already interested in measuring on their database so I can only say this is just a matter of time to get the data, the exposure data. The other thing is that I want to mention here that the Dutch competent authorities, they have already made a market survey and like the Austrian, the Swiss and the Germans, they have realized that the hexamol dinge is used already in roughly 60% of the toys for children and therefore, they focused on looking for real migration data. They took the head over heels method developed at the Joint Research Center, and it's, I think, already the world standard in the meantime. And the migration report from Hexamol Dinge and other plasticizers used in toys is published, and I've sent a copy to Mike Barbish, so that you can have a look on these data. Um, and that is, I think, all what I wanted to concentrate on. Thank you. Any questions? Um, well, let me. <clears throat> Let me start by commenting on the, um, the Versar report. Uh, your uh, in the, the table where they listed the toxline hits was... Toxline hits versus probability right. to get it in <clears throat> toys. And that was 
uh, a preliminary screen. Yeah. So that was not meant to be the, the final answer. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the screening process for selecting which ones to look at, at uh, in more detail. Um, let me see. Uh, Mike, may I just comment on, on that yes. thing here? I think you see that the, the, the public um, is respecting the work you are doing, so everybody is uh, interested in what you do. So the published stuff was out, and we were approached by some customers whether this means that there are questions. Because it gives, in my view, the false impression that Toxline hits would say anything about the safety of the substance. And by the x-axis, where you say the probability goes higher, based on this Toxline score and based on this data protection issues, of course you can't win that game. <laughs> yeah. So the, the key issue in, in, in my view is how can we reconcile that and how can we support your valuable work um, with uh, help or comments that on questions that you have based on the data compilations that we already have provided. Yeah, and I guess um, I'm, I understand that REACH gives you protection. Um, uh, because your your data, you have a significant investment in in these data, um, but that is in a sense, uh, uh, um, I guess that was a something uh, a decision you made. You you pro had to submit those data to reach in order to presumably manufacture uh, Dinch in uh, in Europe, but. <clears throat> Here, um, where REACH does not apply, I'm wondering what would be the consequences if you were to release uh, some of those studies to the public? Um, Mike, that is, that is exactly the issue. When we would provide the study reports to you, which we still can do, provided that you can guarantee the confidentiality of the full study reports and mm -hmm. data protection for the full study reports. Because in that case where you post it in the internet, then REACH says this is a publicly available study and any third party can just write down an own robust study summary. That is at least the interpretation of our lawyers <coughs> and also the CEFIC uh, lawyers would go um, here in the same way. So in that case where you have that full study report available on the internet, you might run into problems. We have the same issues, for example, with the biocide regulations in Europe, where you get study uh, ownership protection in the biocide directives. And if these studies would then be used on the reach and also would go public, they would lose their thing. It's, a, I think, an essential thing that also would apply to a U.S. company if they would provide you study reports in the best shape for transparency. You would put them up, and they have lost their money. And that's, I think, what you did not mean to do. Well, I, I, I guess my question is: you, it, it's the it, what you would lose is the investment in your studies. Um, <clears throat> and perhaps uh, uh, market share, um, you, would you be breaking any laws under REACH if you were to make those data public? No, no definitely not. <clears throat> and uh, you also could probably work <clears throat> based on the published robust study summaries that an independent competent authority, the Australians did, <clears throat> because they are here uh, in that way that they take the report, they keep them confidential, but they do their own study summaries and they post them in the internet. And we have provided you also this link. Right. So if right. that would be uh, okay for you, 
the way to deal with the issue, you could work on that one. And if there are detailed questions, and I'm pretty sure the toxicologists know where to ask when they need some information, we would be happy to support you there. It's just a matter of data protection. <laughs> and we do have the, the actual, well, we have the, the robust summaries. You have them, yes. Andreas? I appreciate your concerns about uh, data ownership. That's, uh, that's only understandable. On the other hand, you know the charge. We are supposed to make judgments about alternative products uh, to the best of the science that's currently available. And you pointed out yourself that's a, that's a serious conflict. So if we as the panel don't get those data to look at, that could be done either confidentially or not. But if they're not available to us, the only uh, course of action open to us is to say we cannot properly investigate DINCH as an alternative. Yep. The, I think that, as you said, uh, and you, you said a very important thing, that you might be in a position that you can treat a full study reports in a confidential manner. If that is the case, that should be not a problem. We just want to avoid that the full study report, for example, a two-generation study with more than 1,000 pages, is going up to the Internet. And it's not a problem of the robust study summaries that you will then do. As you can see, Vignas has done that. The Dutch guys have done it. We have provided you study reports. And when you would apply or when you would, ju would just wait until dissemination of data, you would get the same study summaries from the EU. Because that is foreseen under REACH that after a certain time, the full registration files will be made publicly available. So if, if there is a way forward, we are happy to assist you. Well, I, you know, I think for, uh, I can't speak for the panel, but it's, it's the issue of transparency and, and, and whether uh, the studies that the CHAP reviews are available to public scrutiny. Um, they would have to be available to the public, not necessarily posted on the internet, but they would have to be available. Um, as far as the CPSC staff is concerned, uh, it's, it's clear. We would want the data to be public. Uh, the panel has expressed that sentiment uh, at the last meeting. Uh, but again, it's, it's how to proceed is, uh, I think, their decision. Well, may I? Okay. I only can offer that we are open for that. Uh, we can uh, hand over the full study reports for your review, provided we get some data protection. When then you are coming up with robust study summaries, that's not the problem. But I <clears throat> I hope you appreciate our dilemma. Um, if, if these data are not made available, uh, one way or the other, and I'm not sure about the implications uh, of them being made available to us confidentially, I have to take advice from uh, Dr. Babich there. But, but uh, it's very easy, very simple. Uh, we cannot evaluate uh, the um, harmlessness, let me put it this way, of Dinch in any way. But there's one, you could help us out. You could help us out. If you are so certain about Dinch and that there's no harm, why don't you publish in the peer-reviewed scientific literature and then everyone's happy? That is the problem at the moment of the workload that we have with REACH. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, we have to meet the deadline for several hundred other products and you need some time because the thing that you address here is the published, the, the, the published journals. What do you get in the published journal? 
because these are journals that you take. And also for other plasticizers, you have given reference to NIGNAS. The NIGNAS report already is available with all the summaries. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, BASF is the world's biggest chemical company. I'm sure you have the resources, if you want to, to publish that in the scientific peer-reviewed <coughs> literature. We are working on that, but uh, you need it very quickly, and so there might be a conflict uh, of timing, because we have heard this morning... 18. Yeah, but in the 18 months, we have still six months to go for REACH for several hundred of other products. But we will consider that. That's if, if that is the only way. The other way I have already uh, designed for you because you have used for other products the NICNAS evaluations and you have got study summaries. And if you have specific questions where you want to have more details, no problem. We even could come and discuss with you or the um, consultants these specific questions. Um, the only thing is that we have to, to sort out the issue of the whole data protection. And that's for every company involved. So that's our dilemma at the moment. <laughs> Well, you know, you mentioned that, uh, I, was it the Netherlands or in Europe where 60% of the toys have dinge? And I think that's probably true here as well. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's literally going into kids' mouths and, you know, we, we don't have the date, the full studies yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but the Netherlands, they have already uh, done that independent review and they have had access to the full study reports. The scientific committee of the EU, they have signed a non-disclosure agreement. They have had access to the whole study reports. The Australian competent authorities had the same. The Swiss competent authority, the Canadians already have the study reports evaluated. I mean, this, this is a little bit different because we're not talking about uh, a registration uh, process. We're talking about a, a, a major risk assessment that will be, mm -hmm. uh, that will have broad implications. Mm -hmm. in, in, and I think it's a very different situation. Um, you know, you mentioned some of the other programs, uh, HPV program, for example, it's, it's a purely voluntary program. So uh, that makes sense that uh, the robust summaries would be uh, uh, the primary means of submitting data. <laughs> yeah. But you, you have seen that um, A, the competent authorities in Europe on this um, meeting in Berlin already address the upcoming alternatives. They do their own evaluations They do the, because they have the data in-house and they do their own exposure measurements by doing own and independent migration studies for lots of plasticizers. And I think you can profit from these guys because there should be a clear exchange under the uh, parties. And I am pretty sure that when you as the chap of the CPSC would approach a competent authority in Europe that w you would get at least what they have compiled. This is the German government? It's the German Environmental Protection Agency and the German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment, the BFR. Okay. And we can uh, provide you also with the details of the persons involved. Sure. But, but it would be good to have a bit more cooperation from you in these matters. Um, I'd like to highlight to you our dilemma with your robust summaries, mm -hmm. um, which we studied carefully already. On page uh, 113 of the Redinch robust summary, there's a table um, <coughs> giving data about carcinogenicity, and the table is cut off 
in the higher dose range for the females, at least in the PDF version I have. So okay. we cannot we cannot even properly evaluate the yeah. robust summary. Pretty Concerning clear. the reproductive toxicity yeah. in the same robust summary, it is a little unclear to me whether the studies you mentioned this morning uh, were carried out, uh, changes in anodental distance, um, etc., etc. The as far as is obvious to me, uh, you did a reproductive toxicity study mainly looking at uh, limb malformations, etc., etc., and there were no effects. But in this robust summary, I cannot find any data that hint at what you mentioned this morning about changes in anogenital distance. These are the endpoints that are really relevant. I have found these hints. They are in. Oh, maybe and I sorry. should get uh, new glasses. And no, no, no. It's not a matter of glasses. Probably it. What you um, described to me uh, that tables uh, are cut on the, the edge. That's right. That is very often a problem of different printer settings. I'm sorry for that. That's the stupidity of the PDF files. I know. But uh, you see our uh, dilemma. We can't even okay. properly no, examine your robust yes, summary. No, no problem at all. We will provide you uh, in these tables in a form that you really have all. And it's already published, sorry for hammering on that, by the NICNAS. They have the whole incidence tables in the internet. But we will provide you the corrected version. OK, uh, can I just carry on with, with another detail? You mentioned the FOSTA protocol um, in your presentation, Dr. Otter, and what you have found. You say you found changes in anodental distance. Um, reductions in both males and females okay at 1000 milligram per kilogram in both sexes yeah um did you look at changes in uh, nipple retention um that was exactly the reason why we discarded that because a uh anogenital distance anogenital index is dependent on body weight and second balneo uh, proportional separation all the other parameters none of them was affected it was just this. So nip, retained nipples was also not affected? Nothing, nothing. Um, the weight of um, sex accessory glands, did you look at that? Yes. Not affected at all? Affected, not affected at all. And it is also contained in the study summaries that we have provided. Okay. And, sorry, let me that add this. This laboratory, and you can find the citation, for example, in the CERHR, is very much experienced in anogenital distance and anogenital index measurements because it's not an easy task. And they know how to deal with the issue, and we have addressed that again in the 2Gen, where we couldn't see anything. The question I have actually is of a different direction, but you had mentioned about developing um, methods for the German EPA for biomonitoring yes. for DINCH. Could you tell us more about that? And is it for s uh, specific metabolites? Yes. <coughs> um, Russ, it's um, pretty clear. Um, this project will address the DINCH metabolites and also the DPHP metabolites, we do it for both because we see that these products are more and more coming into use and therefore we wanted to provide clear facts to um, be able to respond. Um, currently the metabolites are synthesized. Uh, they have uh, D4 labeling and uh, we are developing the methods in the next couple of months and then um, I think we will also go for this conversion factor study type so somebody and most probably myself we will swallow the stuff and have some urinary metabolites detected and so we can then go from the urinary level to a back calculation to the external dose we have within the European Council of Plasticizers and Intermediates done exactly such a study with 
uh, establishment of conversion factors for 10 males and 10 females, which roughly um, yeah, confirmed the results published by Holger and by Jürgen, Holger Koch and Jürgen Angerer. It's the same a ballpark of percentage of those that arrives in the urine. What we could see is no difference between the 10 males and the 10 females and no age difference, which was quite interesting. And I'm pretty sure that we will be in a couple of months in a position to uh, provide the same robust conversion factors for these chemicals. And at the moment, we are currently in the stage of synthesizing for the DPHP. It's just contracted last week for the DINGE. The metabolites are nearly completed and we are about to start. And it's both in urine. That's the primary focus. The primary focus is there because the German Environmental Protection Agency, they want first of all to screen and Marike Kolosagering, probably you have heard some presentations from her or will put it in their presentations. They would like to screen their environmental biological database that they have from human specimen in the refrigerator and they want to screen them whether it's important based on concentration, based on prevalence uh, and that things. That is the project. Sounds like within a few months some of this information will be available. Uh, at, at least until end of the year is the target to have the methods established. Then we have to uh, hand over the method to the Uber guys. Uh, we will also hand over um, the method how you produce the standards and we will indicate where the standards can be ordered from so that they are equipped and there will also be some yeah, in the laboratory, some small, not, not a full round drop-in, but you have to transfer the method to another independent uh, laboratory and this help will also be given. So data will come in. And not only for DINGE, also for DPHP. Okay, thank you. I think we'll uh, move on to the next presentation, Dr. Holt. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Holt and I represent Eastman Chemical Company. Eastman Chemical Company is here as both the producer of several phthalate plasticizers that the CHAP is uh, uh, considering, but also as a producer of Eastman 168, which is di 2 ethyl hexyl terephthalate, which is uh, being considered as a phthalate alternative. We also are a member of the phthalate ester panel of the American Chemical Council and representatives of the uh, phthalate ester panel, I think, are going to be making some presentations later on today. Uh, I'm just going to be speaking about these alternatives this morning. Di-2-ethylhexyl terephthalate, DEHT, it's sometimes also abbreviated as DOTP, has been around for approximately 40 years. Despite the word phthalate in the name, DEHT is, is not a, considered a phthalate ester. DEHT, and in fact all terephthalate plasticizers, are based on terephthalic acid, which is 1,4-benzene dicarboxylic acid, and not 1,2-benzene dicarboxylic acid, which is the building block for phthalate plasticizers. Uh, this simple distinction, which may seem trivial, is actually uh, important for several physical properties of terephthalate plasticizers. For example, DEHT is significantly less volatile than DOTP, or sorry, than uh, DEHP. Uh, it's approximately as, as volatile as DINP, so a higher molecular weight phthalate. It's also approximately 10 times less soluble than DEHP. These properties are important when considering exposure via, for example, indoor air, processing, or direct contact. 
The metabolism of DEHT is also different from DEHP and other phthalate plasticizers. Many studies have shown that DEHT readily breaks down to terephthalic acid and 2-ethylhexanol with very little mono 2 ethylhexyl terephthalate being formed. So we get complete breakdown from the plasticizer to terephthalic acid and, and alcohol. Uh, Earl Gray has studied the uh, metabolism of, of phthalates and uh, concluded in one of his uh, reports, in order for a phthalate ester to be metabolized to an active monoester, the ester groups must be in the ortho position. DOTP, remember that's another name for uh, DEHT, which is isomeric with DEHP, but reportedly not metabolized to MEHP, monoethyl hexyl phthalate, uh, was inactive in the current study. And that, that result uh, we see over and over again. DEHT exhibits in metabolism studies complete and rapid breakdown into terephthalic acid and 2-ethylhexanol. Uh, terephthalic acid has a wealth of toxicological data. It's a key component of PET, which is a common plastic used in water bottles like you have on the table there. So that's the T in, in PET. Uh, terephthalate plasticizers don't exhibit reprotox concerns, endocrine disruption, nor modulation, peroxisome proliferation, nor carcinogenicity concerns. Uh, despite many comments that alternatives to phthalate plasticizers do not have adequate data to support their use, DEHT has a complete toxicological data set including uh, acute toxicity, genotoxicity, repeat exposure, developmental tox, reprotox, carcinogenicity, and in all these studies you can note the very high no observed ad adverse effect levels. So I think this is one of the things that's been mentioned over and over again is that alternatives to phthalates don't have complete data sets, and there certainly are alternatives to phthalates that have complete data sets. All of this data is available in published and peer-reviewed manuscripts that have been submitted to the chat. We do have some specific comments on the uh, CPSC document review and exposure a review of exposure and toxicity data for phthalate substitutes. The document states on page 12 uh, that the bioconcentration factor of DEHT is 1.4 million. Um, and in the summary on page 68, it states that based on an estimated BCF of uh, 1,400,000, DEHT should bioconcentrate in aquatic organisms. However, DEHP, which is structurally similar to DEHT, has a measured BCF of only 637. Uh, Eastman has measured the BCF of DEHT uh, and measured it as 393. In addition, there's a report by Turi, uh, that I give the reference, where they report a BCF of 25 for DEHT. Um, so we would just like this correction to be noted. In the same document on page 60, it states that DEHT has been shown to be a sensitizer in guinea pigs. Uh, the particular study cited was deemed invalid in the context of the OECD review. Uh, furthermore, no evidence of sensitization was seen in two subsequent studies on guinea pigs and on a human patch study. And these, these reports have also been submitted. So we just like this correction to be noted. We'd also like to point out an additional report on the differences in the metabolism of DEHT, here again abbreviated DOTP, when compared to a variety of phthalate plasticizers. The table shows the estimated potencies descri uh, describe the potential of each phthalate to disrupt testicular function and or produce malformations in male rat offspring. And here we again see DOTP or DEHT showing no activity. So in conclusion, uh, Eastman 168 DEHT is a well-studied material with a robust set of data. All the data are published and were peer-reviewed by countries participating in the OECD SIDS program. Terephthalate esters have little or no potential to form an active monoester. Terephthalate esters demonstrate rapid and almost complete metabolic hydrolysis back to terephthalic acid and the corresponding alcohol. Uh, and they do not possess the same toxicological issues as orthophthalate esters. I have a couple of comments about some uh, regulatory clearances and, and approvals around the world. Uh, diethylhexyl terephthalate uh, 
has a food contact notification, um, FCN 770, which comprises a, uh, quite a long list of typical food contact notifications for use in uh, uh, adhesives and uh, pressure sensitive adhesives, gaskets, uh, a variety of uh, applications for food contact. Also is uh, listed under the European Food Safety Authority under EC 975-2009. You've heard a lot about this report uh, in the last couple of minutes. Uh, DEHT, the Dutch uh, RIVM in their, in their risk assessment of non-phthalate plasticizers and toys measured the migration of several non-phthalate plasticizers from toys. The low migration of DEHT is in accordance with the low migration recently reported by the CPSC report uh, and is in both studies the lowest migration of any alternative. So here's the DEHT. So we see that uh, in addition to having uh, uh, low hazard potential exposure for DEHT is, is significantly lower than some other alternatives. The RIVM also calculated margins of safety for DEHT. Uh, and so for example, the margin of safety uh, for exposure due to mouthing is 7,300 and 12,000 for exposure due to dermal contact. The report's uh, conclusion was that the calculated margins of safety for DEHT and DINCH are very high, leading to the conclusion that these compounds are not expected to pose any health risk for toy users at the migrated levels. And again, I would point out that the extraction levels that uh, were measured here are very, very similar to the ones that are measured by the CPSC in the, in the recent CPSC report. Uh, DEHT has recently been commercialized in medical devices in the EU. It was based on a thorough risk assessment by an independent toxicologist. Uh, very low extraction was demonstrated in use. Uh, and of course, the final medical device was tested. And this, this, these products are commercially uh, available in, in Europe right now. Uh, and in the US, a drug master file for, for ASMIN 168 is available and uh, it's being referenced by various device, medical device manufacturers who are testing uh, Eastman 168 for use in medical devices. Uh, one other comment, uh, I, I know we had a, a small discussion this morning about the amount of work that you have to do. Uh, and I hate to point out that there is another alternative to phthalates that's available out there, uh, and that is benzoate esters. Uh, there's a variety of them, so it's, it's, a, it's a class of compounds. There's a variety of them uh, commercially available. Uh, they've been reviewed by Kawi for, for ECA, uh, and they've focused on, on them as a replacement for BBP, DBP, and DEHP, and they recommended specifically dipropylene glycol dibenzoate as a replacement for either BBP or DBP in their study. Uh, we'll be submitting a significant amount of data to the CHAP on these particular compounds. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions? Um, yes, you, you didn't mention TXIB, uh, which is a, I understand, not used by itself as a plasticizer, but it's used in combination with others. But we do see it <clears throat> in, in toys. Um, can you tell us about the, the database on TXIB and, and what might be available there? Uh, I'm not a toxicologist and I don't have all of our uh, data in my mind right now, the, the list of, of data. The database is not as robust as Eastman 168, uh, although we have a, a, a quite large database. East, uh, TXIB is not used as a plasticizer per se. It's used in plasticols to lower the viscosity of the plasticol. It has some plasticizing ability, so you're correct, it's never used on its own. It's also generally used at very low levels compared to a normal plasticizer, where a normal plasticizer might be used at 30 or 40 percent in a toy. Uh, TXIB might be down at 5 percent. So a lot of the studies where people have looked at TXIV, they don't take into account the use level being significantly lower than a typical plasticizer. 
So uh, we will submit uh, data on TXIB. Um, it's, it's, uh, for its typical uses, it's been a sufficient data set, but we probably need to uh, fill in some holes now, given the, given the kind of uh, uh, uses that people are looking at. It's so a kind of a general question. When you when you do your studies, you're saying you're submitting these data. Do you ever look at these chemicals together in your studies, or do you do them one at a time? What, we do them one at a time because for all the agencies that ask for it, that's the way they ask for the specific studies. Uh, the old idea of doing mixtures is for the chemical companies in particular a new a new question. It's the same line of questions in terms of biomonitoring. So, um, you know, I'm not a chemist, but looking at the um, metabolites, they seem very nonspecific. So, would there be methodologies available to monitor human exposure or, or no? Uh, we haven't looked at that. Uh, generally speaking, and again, I'm not a toxicologist, but metabolites that I'm aware of that people look at for orthothalates are oxidized monoesters as a, as a common metabolite to look at. Uh, since with DEHT you don't form monoester, you tend to find that the material breaks down to TPA and the alcohols. So again, TPA has a, terephthalic acid has a, has a lot of data on it in, uh, just in general because of its use in, 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 uh, in plastics and 2-ethylhexanol as well. So. When you say it has a lot of data in general, do you mean data in humans, biomonitoring, or do you mean toxicity? Toxicity data. Biomonitoring, I don't, I don't know that there's any, been any biomonitoring on any of the alternatives yet because it's a, a fairly new area. Okay, thanks. Be able to
Good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Jansen. I'm a physician, uh, board certified in occupational and environmental medicine. I'm also uh, trained as a reproductive biologist. And um, my comments to you this morning are um, from the Natural Resources Defense Council, where I serve as a senior scientist and focus on endocrine disrupting chemicals in consumer products. NRDC has been um, closely watching this process, and I um, viewed your f first meeting over the web. So my comments to you are largely based on um, responses to some of the things that you were discussing at that meeting, as well as some of the um, concerns and uh, interests that we have as you go through this process. So um, an overview of what I'm going to talk about today, and I'll make sure that you all get uh, copies of this presentation. I apologize you don't have them in your binders. Um, are, uh, they're relatively brief. I'm going to talk about uh, the standard reasonable certainty of no harm, um, a little bit of a discussion, and I'll, I know you have some experts coming tomorrow to talk about paroxysm, proliferation, um, our list of phthalates of concern, and then um, just a mention of what many of you on the panel already know about um, the NAS report. So uh, the reasonable certainty of no harm standard was actually defined in the Food Quality Protection Act in 1996, and this amended how US EPA evaluates and regulates pesticides. It established a, a new standard for safety for tolerance of these chemicals in or on residues of food. And um, it was the intent of Congress, at least as I listened to Congress when they put together the CSPIA, that the same standard would apply for looking at the use of phthalates in children's products. And in that standard, which is um, denoted by the legislative history, which I'll also supply to the panel if you don't already have it, um, from the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee report, um, these are direct quotes from that uh, committee report, that safe means that there is a reasonable certainty of no harm that will re uh, result from the aggregate exposure. In this case, the discussion was about pesticide chemical residues, but you could apply that to phthalates. And second, that aggregate exposure to the pesticide chemical residue includes dietary exposures under all tolerances and exposure from other non-occupational sources as well, which is consistent with the standard that you guys have all been charged with using. And then the, the language goes on to discuss both threshold and non-threshold effects. I've um, pulled out the quote for the non-threshold effects here because um, as you're also going to hear later on um, in your discussions in the meeting, um, the NAS has recommended in risk assessment that we no longer assume threshold effects unless there is uh, evidence to support that. So for the non-threshold effects, the standard is if there is any increase in lifetime risk based on quantitative risk assessment using conservative assumptions will be no greater than negligible. And then this next paragraph def defines what negligible is. And that essentially comes down to EPA's interpretation that a negligible risk is no, no more than one in a million lifetime risk. So <clears throat> uh, the committee report uh, ended by saying that the statutory language was not set in stone, that as risk assessment methodologies progress, um, that EPA could amend them, but that they should be at least as equally protective of public health. And so then my own comments here at the bottom are is that this really sets a pretty high bar for uh, a level of confidence that the exposure is going to be safe in all populations as well as um, reiterates that you must consider exposures from multiple sources. Um, moving on to paroxysm proliferation, I am um, by far no means a, a paroxysm proliferation expert, but I, um, in listening to your discussions uh, at the last chat meeting, it seemed that there was um, a, ten a tendency to dismiss some of the uh, study findings from paroxysm proliferation because it was thought that perhaps that mechanism is not relevant in humans. And I just wanted to bring up, and I know that you're probably going to discuss this in more detail later, um, that there is um, emerging scientific evidence that um, PPAR uh, is probably a little bit more complicated than just a single mechanism, that there's actually no single hallmark event, but a combination of molecular single signals and multiple pathways that contribute to the formation of tumors, especially in the liver. And based on this emerging um, science, IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which has previously downgraded the carcinogenicity level of DEHP, is going to be reevaluating the carcinogenicity of this chemical this fall um, based on evidence of PPAR in 
alpha independent um, mechanisms. And um, I thought it would also be helpful for you all to review some of the recent NAS report recommendations which discuss peroxisome proliferation. And these are quotes with the reports referenced after each of them. The first is that there is evidence that hepatic, testicular, and pancreatic cancers are associated with phthalate exposures, quote, may be mediated by mechanisms independent of PPAR alpha, end quote. And the second from Science and Decisions, which, are also, which you're going to hear about later in your meeting, uh, was that it calls into question concluding uh, conclusions regarding DEHP's carcinogenic risk to humans. And finally, from the tetrachloroethylene report, which just was published in 2010, important knowledge gaps remain to be addressed. The committee is not yet convinced of the proof of the hypothesis that PPAR alpha modes of action is the sole mode of action and that it's premature to draw definitive conclusions regarding the relevance of PPAR alpha modes of action to human hepatocarcinogenesis. hepatocarcinogenesis. So uh, that's all to say that um, as you're deliberating the different health effects associated with phthalates that I think you um, need to consider liver toxicity, especially in light of these PPAR alpha independent mechanisms which have been identified in the literature, as well as some um, human epidemiological um, literature as well as non-human primate literature. So these are just a couple of studies um, the first is a relatively old study from the 1980s which found persistent changes with IV exposure to DEHP. And we're continuing to see evidence of liver toxicity, especially in um, infants in the neonatal intensive care units who are exposed to DEHP from medical devices. So there was a study published last year which um, demonstrated that uh, infants in the neonatal intensive care unit developed cholestasis after use of DEHP containing medical devices. And when the hospital switched out to DEHP free, the incidence of cholestasis dropped dramatically. And then a second study looking at the incidence of hepatoblastoma, which is a very rare but aggressive and malignant tumor in infants, which also was associated with the use of DEHP in medical devices. And then I wanted to turn to PPAR gamma, which is another um, peroxisome proliferation um, mode of action which has been shown to be activated by phthalates. PPAR gamma is very important in adipogenesis and adipocyte differentiation. Endocrine disruptors have been shown to activate this uh, form of peroxisome proliferation, and in particular the tributyl tins where it's been shown to increase fat mass in rodent studies. And this was shown after a single or perhaps even just a small episodic exposure, which resulted in permanent changes in the way that the adipocytes differentiated. Um, phthalates have also been shown to activate PPAR gamma. And there's recently been some uh, epidemiological studies published linking phthalates, especially the metabolites of betel benzyl phthalate and DEHP with increased weight circum waist circumference and insulin resistance in men. And this is from. Um, Shauna Swan's group, and I know that she's going to be speaking with you tomorrow as well, so hopefully she'll talk about this in a little more depth. Um, this is uh, a list of phthalates in addition to the six that uh, you all are considering um, that I've identified as being of concern for their developmental or reproductive toxicity, which have been published either by an authoritative body or in the peer-reviewed literature. Um, in particular, diisobutyl phthalate um, is a replacement for dibutyl phthalate. And if you look at the latest NHANES human biomonitoring, you'll note that most of the phthalates have either plateaued in levels of exposure or are starting to decline, with the exception of diisobutyl phthalate, where levels seem to be uh, rising slightly, which indicates that perhaps this phthalate is increasingly being used as a replacement for some of the other phthalates. And um, I wanted to also talk about uh, sources of exposure. In 2007, NRDC went to our local drugstore and bought 14 air fresheners, sent them to a lab um, that is EPA certified, and had them tested for phthalates. Uh, we tested for about um, a dozen different phthalates, and I'll supply the full report and methodology to the committee. But in general, there were eight aerosols, five um, freestanding, continuous emitting liquids and one solid um, that sat on like a desktop. Um, the majority of them, 12, were found to contain phthalates. None of them, of course, were on the label. 
and a couple of them were even uh, labeled as being unscented or all natural products. Um, the concentrations varied widely from 0 0.1 parts per million to 7,300 parts per million. Three of the samples contained greater than 100 parts per million and over half of them had more than two phthalates. Most of the phthalates that we found were either DBP, DEHP, DIBP, or DMPP, um, but we also found in a single sample diisohexyl phthalate. So um, we know that there's a wide range of, of, of different types of exposure to phthalates in addition to toys, fragrances, um, including the air fresheners, building materials, especially vinyl um, flooring, food and food packaging, automobile interiors, artificial leather, printing inks, paints, adhesives, garden hoses, which is especially relevant, I think, in the summertime as people are drinking water out of the hose in the hot weather, um, shower curtains, medical devices, and pharmaceuticals. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have the information about which types of phthalates are used in which types of products. And so I think it would be really great as we're hearing our talks from um, the industry representatives today if they could give us some more information about where phthalates are being used in these different types of consumer products. And then I wanted to end um, with an urge for the committee to have one of your own members who sat on this um, NAS report um, give a, a summary of, of this report, um, the cumulative phthalates and cumulative risk assessment, which was published at the end of 2008. Several of the CHAP members sat on this committee. Um, they made some very strong recommendations for how a cumulative risk assessment for phthalates should be done and made the conclusion that a, a cumulative risk assessment based on common adverse outcomes is feasible and a physiologically relevant approach for the evaluation of the mul multiplicity of human exposures and directly reflects, in this case, EPA's mission to protect public health. I would argue it also directly reflects CPSC's mission to protect the public health. So um, in conclusion, Congress has set a pretty high bar and a pretty ambitious agenda for this panel. Um, but we also feel that by using the standard of reasonable certainty of no harm, that this um, is a high bar for confidence in the conclusions of safety about the use of phthalates. It's important that you fully consider the range of different health endpoints associated with phthalate exposure, not just the male reproductive health outcomes, but also female reproductive health outcomes, liver toxicity, effects on the breast, um, adipose tissue and metabolism, as well as the cumulative and ag aggregate exposures to different um, uh, types of phthalates and the sensitivity to vulnerable populations. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for being um, flexible in your scheduling for those of us who can't control when our flights land. And um, I'll be happy to take any comments or questions. Any questions? Mike? Yeah. Uh, the definition of a level of where there's reasonable certainty of no harm uh, is comes from the FQPA. Uh, is that different, or how does that differ from a reference dose or an acceptable daily intake? Um, well, I'm not a risk assessor, so there are probably people here who could explain that better than I. But um, a reference dose is uh, based on a risk assessment um, methodology, and uh, for cancer effects, it typically has represented a one in a million lifetime risk of exposure. Um, and then a reference concentration has to do with air or inhalation exposures. An acceptable daily intake is calculated somewhat differently. Um, I'm more familiar with FDA using that um, reference standard, which is um, based more on a margin of safety. Um, but in, in, uh, in the FQPA, they also stipulate that um, the safety factors should account for extrapolation from animal uh, studies to humans as well as uh, vulnerable populations such as children, infants, and um, pregnant women. Uh, and you mentioned breast tissue. Could you uh, clarify that a little bit? Uh, well, my colleague here from the Breast Cancer Fund is going to be speaking next and talk about some of the studies uh, where phthalates have been shown to um, interact with breast tissue. Yeah. 
Do you want me to um, eject this disk, or do you want to save it on the computer up here? I can leave it until the panel's done. Yeah, that might be helpful. And this is on, okay, well, yes it is. Uh, good morning, let me, is there, hello, okay. My name is Daniel Pinchina and I'm here representing the Breast Cancer Fund, the only national organization focused on preventing breast cancer by identifying and advocating for the elimination of the environmental and other preventable causes of the disease. The Breast Cancer Fund was a strong supporter of the phthalate provision within the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act. We are pleased that you have begun your work uh, reviewing the science on the health implications of phthalates and we're grateful for the opportunity to present these comments. As you know, phthalates are used in a wide variety of consumer products in addition to toys and children's products, including food packaging, personal care products such as soap, shampoo, deodorant, hand lotion, nail polish, cosmetics and perfume, home vinyl siding, flooring, furniture, car interiors, detergent, solvents, lubricants, glue, paint, and medical equipment, including IV bags. Biomonitoring has confirmed that phthalates migrate into the air, into food, and ultimately into people, including babies in utero. Phthalates have been found in indoor air and dust, in human urine, blood, and breast milk. Levels are highest in children ages 6 to 11 and in women, and African Americans have higher levels of phthalates than Caucasians. Phthalates are known endocrine disruptors and can affect normal hormonal processes. Phthalate exposures have been linked to reduced testosterone levels, lowered sperm counts in adult men, genital defects in baby boys, and early puberty in girls. Moreover, several studies in humans have shown some of the toxic effects of phthalates at levels similar to what the average American is currently exposed to. As an organization working to prevent breast cancer, we're extremely concerned about the endocrine disrupting qualities of those chemicals. Despite the growing evidence, we know that scientific certainty is rare and often policy questions need to be answered before the science is clear. As you review the available evidence on the health impacts of phthalates, we urge you not to require absolute certainty before recommending action be taken to reduce human exposure to these chemicals to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. In the CPSIA, Congress wisely tasks you with considering a number of factors before making a determination on phthalates. Traditional toxicology methods, one chemical at a time from a single source on an adult, assuming a linear dose response relationship are outdated and do not provide an adequate or frequently even accurate description of how a particular chemical impacts human health. We're therefore pleased that Congress explicitly listed several specific elements to guide your safety assessment in the statute, including reviewing all health endpoints, combinations of phthalates, impact of the timing of exposure, cumulative impact of all sources and routes of exposure, all of the relevant peer-reviewed studies and the impact on vulnerable populations, including children, pregnant women, and other vulnerable populations. Congress also called for the safety review to consider, quote, the level at which there is reasonable certainty of no harm to those vulnerable populations, continuing using sufficient safety factors to account for uncertainties regarding exposure and susceptibility of children, pregnant women, and other potentially susceptible individuals, close quote. As advocates, we were heartened to see that Congress placed the burden of proof on manufacturers of phthalates and phthalate-containing products to show that phthalates are safe, not on the government to prove harm. In our work on State of the Evidence, uh, which is a document that uh, the Breast Cancer Fund releases biannually and which I believe has been provided to you all, um, we found a number of themes in the data which are particularly important in assessing endocrine disrupting chemicals and reflect the concerns expressed by Congress in the phthalate provision of the CPSIA. Timing of exposures matters. We learned decades ago from the tragic legacy of DES exposures to hundreds of thousands of pregnant women and their developing fetuses in the 1950s that in utero exposure to synthetic estrogens increases the incidence of reproductive abnormalities and breast cancer in children and grandchildren of the women who took the drug. Similar data from animal models continue to show that prenatal exposures to other synthetic estrogen mimics alter mammary tissue development in ways that predispose animals to increased 
risk for mammary tumors later in life and that these effects may be passed on to subsequent generations through epigenetic mechanisms. Early life exposure to phthalates holds the greatest risk for harm and prenatal exposure to very low doses can have irreversible lifelong effects. Therefore, it is essential to protect children and women childbearing age of childbearing age from exposure to phthalates. Other times of high susceptibility to environmental exposures include adolescence, specifically puberty, and early adulthood prior to the first pregnancy and lactation. Low doses may have profound effects, especially at critical periods of development. The study of endocrine disrupting chemicals, many of which have been implicated in increased risk for breast cancer, has taught us that the traditional mo model of toxicology that the dose makes the poison is outdated and no longer the standard by which we assess the safety of chemicals, particularly endocrine disruptors. We have substantial evidence from wildlife and laboratory studies that exposures to environmental, excuse me, to environmentally relevant levels of endocrine disrupting compounds, even when apparently very low dose in concentration, can alter reproductive development and risk for disease, including breast cancer. Mixtures matter. The effects of phthalates exposure depend not only on timing but also on mixtures of phthalates and their interaction with other environmental factors. In our real lives, we are not exposed to one environmental challenge at a time. Rather, we live in a world where we daily breathe the air, drink the water, walk the grass, work in offices, play with toys, use household cleaning products, apply cosmetics and other personal care products, etc., etc. We are exposed not only to a number of phthalates, but to a vast mixture of chemicals. Each chemical does not act alone. Growing evidence indicates that many of these common exposures work additively and sometimes synergistically, both within the family of phthalates and beyond. Interactions matter. Some of the evidence that is most compelling is the growing literature examining complex interactions between risk factors. These studies are expanding our understanding of the variability of susceptibility to environmental as well as lifestyle, reproductive, and genetic factors. The data are critical for understanding impacts on vulnerable populations and designing community-based studies that examine these important interactions. All of these factors will be important considerations for you in getting an accurate and full picture of how phthalates are impacting the health of children, both at the time of exposure and much later in life when some of these impacts may manifest. In addition to hazard characteristics, you have been asked to look at exposure data not just from toys, but from the numerous other sources of phthalates. As I mentioned, we know some of these sources and biomonitoring data gives us part of the picture of exposure. However, it's frustrating to have to point out that we don't know all the products that contain phthalates, much less which phthalate because our chemical management laws are weak. Not only is safety testing not required before various chemicals, including phthalates, are released into commerce, but frequently our laws don't even require disclosure of ingredients. We know that phthalates are a common component of fragrance used in numer pro numerous products from cosmetics to household cleaning products such as air freshener. Uh, but current law allows industry to hide the component ingredients of quote unquote fragrance as confidential business information, thereby masking the presence of potentially harmful substances including phthalates, uh, understanding parenthetically that Often those products are under the jurisdiction of the Environmental Protection Agency and the FDA, not necessarily the CPSC. Understanding the full scope and level of exposure to phthalates will be an important challenge for this panel to meet. The Breast Cancer Fund and our allies have been focused on the impact of environmental toxicants and the incidence of numerous diseases, including breast cancer, and the need to adopt a precautionary approach to science and policy. As you determine how you will view the existing data on phthalates relative to the risks they pose, we would like to call your attention to two new reports that have informed that discussion. The Endocrine Society and the President's cancel, uh, excuse me, Cancer Panel both released reports on, uh, within the last year that with conclusions and recommendations calling for precaution. The Endocrine Society, as you probably know, is an international association founded in 1916 with 14,000 members representing medicine and a wide variety of scientific disciplines. Last year, this highly esteemed association relieved a scientific statement on endocrine disrupting chemicals, which included a section entitled Endocrine Disruptors, Mammary Gland Development, and Breast Cancer. This section discusses the impact of exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs during critical windows of susceptibility and how those exposures can alter the structure of the breast, making the tissue more sensitive to carcinogenic exposures later in life. 
The scientific evidence led the Endocrine Society to state in a separate position statement, quote, until such time as conclusive scientific evidence exists to either prove or disprove harmful effects of substances, a precautionary approach should be taken in the formulation of EDC policy. We encourage the panel to review and consider this important document. Another voice calling for a precautionary approach to chemicals is the President's Cancer Panel. That panel, ex established in 1971, is tasked with monitoring the development and execution of the, of the activities of the National Cancer Program. In May of this year, the panel released a report entitled Reducing Environmental Cancer Risk, What We Can Do Now. In developing the report, the panel did its own research and held four public meetings where over 45 invited experts representing academia, government, industry, environmental and cancer advocacy co communities, and the public contributed testimony on research, policy, and programs concerning environmental contributions to cancer. Finding that the true burden of environmentally induced cancer has been grossly underestimated, the Reducing Environmental Cancer Risk Report called, uh, issued a call to action to the President and for our nation, a call to reevaluate the role of environmental contaminants in the incidence of cancer, to institute the use of precautionary rather than reactionary policies regarding chemical management, and to create a true national cancer prevention strategy. The public instinctively knows that chemicals in our daily lives threaten our health, and the President's Cancer Panel's review of the scientific evidence confirmed that belief. The President's Cancer Panel's report also included several specific recommendations for what individuals can do. The recommendations related to children reflects the growing concern about EDCs by calling on parents to avoid exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals and known or suspected carcin carcinogens prior to a child's conception and throughout pregnancy and early life. Both of these highly regarded institutions found the scientific evidence to be compelling and called for precautionary action. Answers in science, as I said, are rarely absolute, and absence of knowledge is not the same as absence of harm. The impact of our inaction in the face of substantial evidence of harm is irreversible in terms of public health as a whole and the devastating impact of people's lives. The Breast Cancer Fund strongly urges you in your deliberations and conclusions to adopt a precautionary approach to interpreting the science and to advocate that precaution be, uh, be the foundation for the CPSC's ultimate regulatory decisions regarding phthalates. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Mike? Um, could you clarify what you mean by precaution? Because it's a, it's a word, we hear a lot about the precautionary principle and, and so on, and I'd like to hear your interpretation. Uh, I should preface this by saying that I may be the only non-PhD in the room, so I should, um, uh, be careful not to to play the part of a risk assessor or a scientist and and rather speak for the advocacy community and that is uh, in the broad uh, sense when you're taking a regulatory approach to assessing harm uh, potential risk to the health and the environment uh, the burden of proof should be on the uh, uh, the manufacturer to prove safety and not on the uh, government or the consumer to prove harm. You're welcome. I guess, unfortunately, uh, we are charged with the task of doing that. <laughs> right. <laughs> and thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Diana Zuckerman. I'm president of the National Research Center for Women and Families and our Cancer Prevention and Treatment Fund. And our center focuses on health and safety issues, looking at scientific data and uh, trying to synthesize data from various sources, explain what the differences are and why results can uh, vary and why data are often inconsistent and uh, try to make sense of it from a policy point of view as well as a consumer point of view. Um, just briefly, I'll uh, give you a little bit of information about my perspective. Uh, in addition to being president of the center, I'm a fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Center for Bioethics. 
Um, I was trained in epidemiology and public health at Yale Medical School and um, was on the faculty at Yale and Vassar and conducted longitudinal research at Harvard. So I'm really speaking um, from an epidemiological and public health point of view today, and I'm going to focus on human health, not uh, animal studies, and I'm going to try not to repeat things that have already been said, so I'm gonna be shuffling through my papers, and I'm, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, oh, I should also mention that I I worked in the uh, House of Representatives in the U.S. Senate and the White House, and so um, I've spent a lot of my career uh, trying to bridge the gap between research data and public policy, and particularly health policy. And I will try to do that a little bit um, today. As you all know, phthalates have been found in indoor air and dust and in human urine, blood, and breast milk. Uh, levels are highest in women and, ch and also children ages six through 11, and African Americans have been shown to have higher levels. So I think that's part of my perspective of trying to figure out what's going on and what the impact is going to be. I'll talk a little bit about the most recent research. Um, obviously, um, it's complicated, <laughs> you know that. It's difficult to look at individual phthalates when we have uh, exposure to many different phthalates from many different sources and we don't, as has been said, we don't even know sometimes what they are and where they're coming from. Uh, so we do have to uh, do our best to look at the aggregate data and the cumulative effect and not just the individual uh, products, but also we do need to control for various other uh, confounding variables. And I was a little disturbed. I think I understood uh, one of the earlier uh, speakers on the other panel to talk about how difficult it is to look at certain uh, genital abnormalities because you have to control for weight and size and so on. Well, you just have to. I mean, that's the nature of this kind of research. It's very important to control for as many con potentially confounding variables as possible. And um, it's possible to do that, fortunately, with uh, multivariate analysis. A 2009 research review published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society uh, concluded that there was little correlation between prenatal and postnatal concentrations of phthalate metabolites. And I mention that only because it seems to show that those are quite independent, the prenatal exposures and the postnatal exposures. They're both very important, but they are independent of each other, and we need to look at both of them uh, very carefully. A study by Cho and his colleagues published in the Environmental Health Perspectives in 2010 found that IQ and verbal IQ were lower in elementary school children with DEHP metabolites, but not D DBP metabolites. And after controlling for various demographic variables and developmental covariates, both types of phthalates were associated with lower vocabulary scores. And that was maintained for the DEHP even when they statistically controlled for maternal IQ. So uh, controlling for every variable they could think of that could possibly affect um, IQ and vocabulary, uh, that impact was still there. Boys with more DEHP and MEHP had lower scores on the Wechsler intelligence scale for children on the vocabulary score, but girls did not. So again, have to look at boys and girls. They might be affected differently, but obviously when you're regulating chemicals in the environment, you have to regulate them uh, uh, even if they're only uh, affecting uh, boys and uh, not girls. In 2010, an article by Engel et al., um, also in the environmental health perspectives, uh, found a relationship between prenatal phthalate concentrations and parents' ratings of children's aggression, conduct problems, attention problems, depression, and executive function, which I think you know is uh, the ability to think uh, and organize thoughts in a particular way that's effective. So many of these measures um, are obviously associated with ADHD hyperactivity disorder. So again, we're looking at different kinds of ways that um, these phthalate exposures can affect children and throughout their lives um, as they're developing. A review published this year of the reproductive toxicity data of phthalates in animals um, found uh, some 
uh, alterations, phenotypic alterations in male offspring rats exposed during the prenatal period. And I only, uh, I, I, as I said, I'm going to focus on humans, but certain kinds of studies you can't do on humans, so it's very important uh, to be looking at that. And the authors concluded that biological changes uh, can be induced at low human, quote, low human relevant doses, and that different active phthalates can have cumulative effects, unquote. Um, you know that, and you've heard about the potential for safer uh, substitutes for phthalates, and that's something that uh, we think obviously is very important, and it does appear that there are safer alternatives, and you've heard some about that uh, this morning already. For the most vulnerable populations, I think it's clear the prenatal exposures are very important. Um, and just to mention that according to the fourth national report on human exposure to environmental chemicals, quote, human milk can be a source of phthalate exposure for nursing infants, unquote. Um, children have the highest exposures to phthalates compared to teens or adults. And uh, last year, the German environmental surveys found that the general population is, quote, exposed to phthalates to a large extent and that children are exposed to, quote, up to fourfold higher levels than adults. And obviously, uh, we agree that they are exposed to many different phthalates coming from many different sources. Uh, expectant mothers, of course, are a particular concern uh, to us as well, the prenatal exposures. The cumulative risks are the ones that are the most challenging because, as I said, we don't know exactly where all these uh, exposures are coming from, but you can't just look at one or just at two, or just at four, or just at six, because these are affecting hormones, and in the same way that you would not ever give a young child uh, estrogen pills or estrogen injections, you have to think about how these exposures, how similar they are as if we were doing that. And so even though the data are inconsistent, and sometimes they're inconsistent because it's different animal studies, and sometimes they're inconsistent, I believe, with all due respect, because of the source of the funding of the studies. Um, despite the inconsistencies, there are certain things that are consistent, certain things that we know. We know that when you affect, that, that when you um, expose children and adults to hormones, it affects them. Uh, Dr. Swan did a recent study showing uh, how it can affect uh, what's normally thought of as more feminine behavior in children. We have enough, huh, we have children exposed to phthalates. We can look at phthalate concentrations in their urine. We know what approximately what their exposure level is, or at least we have that proxy measure. I think we should be focusing on human studies, not rat studies, not mouse studies, not animal studies. Um, you know, non-human primate studies obviously are very helpful, but we already have kids exposed to these phthalates, and we should be focusing on what the data can tell us about what is happening to those children. Um, I just want to say a couple of things about some of the specific phthalates that you're looking at. Um, uh, as you know, before the provisional ban, DINP was the phthalate that was most often used to soften plastic in some children's products and toys, and it's also used in flooring, gloves and straws, and garden hoses. It's considered an animal carcinogen, and in an article by Koch uh, and his colleagues published in 2007 in the Journal of Chromatography, he concluded, quote, we also have to regard DINP as an endocrine disruptor modulator in humans. Effects like nipple retention and uh, testis atrophy are comparable to DEHP. And in a more recent article, a 2010 article by Danish scientists that was published in Environmental Health Perspectives, they found phthalate metabolites in the urine of all, all of the four to nine-year-old children that were studied. Boys and girls had higher concentrations uh, oh, I'm sorry, boys and girls who had higher concentrations of phthalates ha um, had lower th thyroid hormones, lower IGF-1, which is an ins insulin-like growth factor, and less growth. So it was clearly uh, a relationship between the phthalate exposure and specifically DINP 
and DEHP that were negatively associated with IGF-1 in boys. Um, okay, I don't think uh, I have any good recent data on some of these other provisional phthalates, and that's really unfortunate that there is a lack of information, and I know that's difficult for you all to deal with, uh, but again, I think we should be demanding that independent research be conducted, human research, before any changes are made in, in the law. We believe that the provisional, um, the interim decision to ban these phthalates in the absence of better data was an excellent and an important decision, and that we shouldn't be uh, changing that just because of lack of conclusive data. We think we need better and more conclusive data, and we should require that. As you know, the cumulative long-term effects are of particular concern, and that's why our center supports the provisional ban and thinks it should be made permanent or at least until data proves otherwise. I think the, uh, the standard discussed earlier is an excellent standard. We want to make sure that we're not doing any harm to children or to adults. And we also believe that you all should be focusing not only on children's toys and children's products, but other exposures uh, to children. And because prenatally is so important, uh, particularly uh, to adults as well. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, one of the things I would like to encourage all of you, if you haven't already done that, is to submit to us uh, peer-reviewed information that you wish us to consider. Any questions? <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, and, and if you could give us a copy of your testimony sure. as well, uh, we'd appreciate that. Um, yeah, you mentioned, uh, uh, well, all the speakers mentioned a bunch of uh, several, a uh, great deal of studies, and if there's a, anything in particular that you think is key, please uh, bring that to our attention. And uh, I've heard uh, breast tissue and breast cancer mentioned several times, and for the panel as a whole, are you aware of any studies linking phthalates to breast cancer? I believe a couple were referred to in my uh, written testimony, but I also um, think I mentioned, and I think we submitted a, a copy of the State of the Evidence report oh. to you all. It's about to be updated, and I will do my best to get you the 2010 version, which I believe um, uh, references some of those as well. I see. So off the top of my head, I know there's a couple of in vitro studies looking at breast cancer cell lines and exposure to uh, butyl benzyl phthalate and DEHP uh, with some estrogenic effects and stimulation of growth of those cells. And then uh, I know that both of those studies are referenced in here, so there's two or three different studies um, with uh, breast-specific endpoints, which we can provide you with. And I would um, just like to add that, of course, that's going to mostly be, I assume, animal studies. I mean, the problem with measuring, obviously, studying cancer is that particularly breast cancer tends to be a very slow-growing cancer. It develops over 15 or 20 years. You can't look at the relationship between um, phthalates and urine, for example, and breast cancer and have a meaningful um, association because... Uh, particularly, we know that risks of breast cancer uh, pertain to hormone exposure as children. We know that uh, when a woman started menstruating, for example, whether she breastfed her children, when she had children, all of these things which affect hormones historically affect her risk of breast cancer 20 years later. So um, we know that when you are affecting hormone levels, whether you do it through birth control pills or hormone replacement therapy or exposure to phthalates, it affects breast cancer. And I do want to mention, in case since this is not an issue probably of uh, study for many of you, that um, the, uh, the numbers of women 
uh, diagnosed with breast cancer and dying of breast cancer has uh, gotten a little bit lower in the last few years, and that is has been attributed by every expert in the country to the reduction of the use of uh, hormone replacement therapy uh, in menopause and just before menopause. So although that lowering of use of hormone replacement therapy is quite recent, um, it's had this profound effect already, statistically significant effect on uh, breast cancer rates. And it is just one example of how when you expose women to estrogen, and whether it's synthetic estrogen, as it is in hormone replacement therapy, or natural estrogen, it, incre um, it increases the risk of breast cancer. So I think that's a really good example. And if I could just add to that, um, there's also, I'm, I'm working on a separate breast cancer and chemical exposure project, and so I've done a quite a bit of breast cancer research over the last year. There is some evidence that while postmenopausal breast cancer rates have plateaued and are decreasing, premenopausal breast cancer rates are actually still on the rise, um, and which suggests that's a very different disease. We know that breast cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. Uh, but it also suggests that in utero and early life exposures to endocrine disrupting chemicals, which alter the development of the mammary gland, can also be very important uh, for uh, the development of breast cancer. And there is no research that I know of for phthalates that are specific to that, but there is for other chemicals like bisphenol A, which are estrogenic, uh, perfluorinated chemicals, uh, which also activate uh, per peroxisome proliferators, and uh, atrazine, which is also a uh, an estrogenic endocrine disrupting chemical. I said I think we have uh, a couple more forthcoming in here, and uh, take the chairman's admonishment to heart. We'll get you those studies as soon as. Chris, this may actually be a question that's um, a little bit removed from your um, testimonies, but. Um, I'm interested in longitudinal studies. Um, you mentioned some studies where you say, you know, increased levels of DEHP or whatever associated with certain kinds of outcomes. Are you aware of any studies where there could be exposures outcome and then some change in exposures and a diminished outcome? I'm thinking about the fact, and I may be incorrect about this, but many of these chemicals, I think, have relatively short half-lives. So. Uh, which could have the impact of, you know, if you can get rid of them, they could, is there going to be a change in, the, in whatever outcome um, just by reducing exposure? Yeah, I mean, I guess the one example I can give is that women who took hormone replacement therapy for years but stopped taking it were still less likely to have be later on diagnosed with breast cancer. So clearly, uh, even very late in the game, uh, changing exposures can um, have a profound effect. But what about exposure to children? Do you know of any studies in that in that regard? I don't know of any studies in children, but I think um, it, for phthalate exposure especially, we've uh, defined in rodents that very specific window of exposure where uh, in utero exposure to phthalates causes permanent changes in the development of the male reproductive tract, which has lifelong impacts. So it, it's sort of, it doesn't matter after that happens, at least in the rodent studies. Um, so uh, that has, you know, uh, implications for both development of the genitals uh, as well as sperm counts and um, sperm quality later in life. Uh, there is other evidence from some of your own panel members about um, epidemiological evidence of exposures, um, especially in men, to phthalates and sperm quality and um, fertility as well as uh, thyroid hormones. But I don't know of any studies where we, ha we have exposure going on and then we take it away. Um, I am doing a study at UCSF with Shauna Swan and her group, and maybe she'll talk about it a little bit more in detail, but we're going to be um, launching a study looking at uh, in utero exposures uh, to phthalates in pregnant women throughout pregnancy and then um, birth outcomes and development of the uh, baby boy genitals. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have any results from that study by the time your um, panel needs to make a conclusion, but there is ongoing research um, and interest in this area. I guess I just want to add that uh, I don't think we've talked very much about early puberty, but there's, the, of course, the concern that um, exposure um, to phthalates might be one of the reasons why so many girls are starting puberty earlier. And just to distinguish, it's not that they're menstruating necessarily any earlier than their mothers, but 
breast development and starting at ages eight and nine. And so you're ending up with girls whose bodies are starting to change to be like women who still haven't learned how to make change for a dollar. Um, it's a very young age that uh, these girls have been um, changed and that kind of exposure is going to be one of the contributing factors, for example, to breast cancer later. But to a answer your question about you know, what, what's the impact of changing, all of these things contribute to breast cancer. I mean, we know that uh, age of menstruation is one of the things that contributes to uh, whether a woman's at higher or lower risk of breast cancer, but so is the age of her first child, if she gives birth, uh, whether she breastfeeds and for how long and how old she was when she does. So throughout the lifespan, there are exposures that affect uh, cancer, particularly breast cancer. Um, so if you can change any of those exposures, one would expect you can lower the risk. One more. Um, as far as I know, uh, phthalates aren't e estrogens per se. They're anti-androgens. So it doesn't mean they couldn't have effects like you described. Right. But the, they're not acting by binding to the right. estrogen receptor. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have distinguished. Any other comments or questions? If not, I guess we're ready to break for lunch. And so Is that what we're scheduled? Yep, yeah, we'll reconvene at 1. Okay. Thank you all.